Hello, I'm Mahathir Pasha and welcome to the first ever episode of LSE Asks. We were given the exclusive opportunity to have a chat with Stella Creasy, Labour MP for Walthamstow and Shadow Minister for Business, Innovation and Skills. But most importantly, she's an ex-student at the LSE. We asked her your questions around important issues including feminism, student finance and the upcoming general elections. Let's take a look. Hello, Stella Creasy, thank you very much for agreeing um, to do this interview with us today. We understand we're limited on time, so we're going to get straight into it. Um, so, the first aspect I want to talk to you about is feminism. Sure. Good. So, it's good nice thing. to hear men talking about feminism. <laughs> One of the things I feel very strongly is that feminism isn't about women, mm. it's about power, and how power is unequally distributed in our society. So 51% of our world never really gets the opportunity to achieve its potential. If sure. we change that, everybody achieves their potential, we'll all benefit. So I'm very, very keen to get across the idea that feminism is for everyone. Mm. Well, um, on International Women's Day, which is not too long ago now, yeah. uh, Helen Pankhurst commented um, that the suffragists would be outraged by um, some of the injustices that women face today. Um, how do you feel about this? Do you think this is true or do you think women are actually in a better footing than some people make them out to be? Some people? Who's that? Well, most of the time it's men, to be honest, so maybe that's not. <laughs> but, I mean, generally... They're, they're I think it's really interesting um, that 40 years on from the Equal Pay Act, we still don't have equal pay in this country. One of the really basic tenets of life, that you should get paid a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Mm. Actually, if you're a woman, that's not necessarily the, the case, because women are still being paid between 10 and 20% less than their male counterparts for the same job. And one thing that really worries me and would worry me for a number of the young women at the LSE is that there's lots of evidence that that pay gap is starting to increase actually for, for people leaving university. Uh, some evidence that it's possibly people going into managerial roles or, or management training roles that men are getting paid more than women. So actually one of those basic tenets from when the, the feminist movement first started about um, you know that we would have equal pay, we can't even manage that. now. There are some very enduring battles around pay and opposition in the economy and some very enduring battles around violence against women. So in this country, two women a week are killed through domestic violence. If that was happening at a football match, you say at football matches, two people were dying every single week, there'd be a national inquiry and there'd be an out outrage about it. Um, you add into those kind of battles about violence against women, not just in the UK, but internationally, what's going on in India, what's going on in Afghanistan, what's going on uh, around the world. Um, and then you add in some of the newer battles that we have to face. So I myself, for example, have been harassed online. Um, we have a very sexualised culture now that perhaps wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the ease with which porn and pornography is shared around and the way in which that's impacting on how men and women are reacting to each other shows me there are some very new battles that we have to take on as well. It's one of the reasons why I'm really passionate about getting really good quality sex and relationship education in schools because right now we teach kids all about the basics of sex but we don't teach them about things like consent so we can actually teach them about respect. Um, in that sense I think what Helen Pankhurst is referring to and what a lot of us are concerned about is we're not making as much progress as we think we are in terms of some of the, perhaps the traditional battles of feminism and there are a whole lot of new ones coming. Um, you know, we live in an 80-20 society, so in my workplace, four out of five of my colleagues are male. That's not politics, that's British society. It's the same in business, it's the same in academia, your vice-chancellors, um, student union leadership. I mean, Tony Pierce is fantastic, but actually she's in the minority in terms of being a woman involved in the student movement as a leader. Um, in our arts, in our judiciary, in our army, women are hitting this 20% glass ceiling. And we're making very little progress in getting over that. So in politics, in the last 15 years, we've only made 4% progress in getting women into parliament. You know, at this rate, my three-year-old niece will be drawing her pension before we get equality in our representative system. We have very old-fashioned and old, enduring inequalities to deal with, and new ones. But the sum total of that is that 51% of our population doesn't get a chance to achieve its potential. And the cumulative impact for all of us is that we all miss out because societies that are more equal are more prosperous and more successful. So one of the things that really frustrated me this International Women's Day, something I said very strongly, is International Women's Day isn't really about women, it's about giving everybody an opportunity to see what a world that was more equal would look like 
and saying, wouldn't it be brilliant if we had more of these voices, if we had all this diversity? Because within those debates around feminism, of course, there are issues around intersectionality and about the fact that um, class and ethnicity and sexuality intersect with gender in terms of those experiences. The great thing for me about International Women's Day is that you get such a diversity of views. It's almost like this magical window of all the things that you could be seeing. And what I've been saying to men is, look, look what you're missing out on. Join the fight, because sure. wouldn't your world be better if you were hearing all these voices all the time as well? Uh, some of the men's rights activists, I agree, are not, not happy whatever you say. Some of them just tell us we should shut our mouths. Yeah. Most men get that there's a different world to be had. They don't always see their role in it. My argument is that you have a very strong role to play in this, not just in saying, yeah, yeah, you know, equality is a good thing, but actually acting yourself. So you being someone who champions and says, why isn't there equal pay? You being somebody who says, why does female genital mutilation take place on our streets in Britain? You know, you being somebody who says, actually, we need to teach boys to respect young girls, and we need to teach young girls that it's okay to say no if they want to, because it's about empowering them and their bodies. And I want to see that in every school, in every college, in every university. I don't know yeah. how the LSE is doing all this stuff right well, now. Sure, but sure. On that note, you'd be happy to hear that um, our general secretary of the LSE is female, Nola, isn't it? She's been re elected twice. She got a lot of support from FemSOC, and there was a lot of male uh, students involved in that as well. And we have a lot of faith in her, so. Fantastic. Yeah. How are you doing on reports of sexual harassment? Because one of the things that a lot of us are concerned about is that there isn't a process for reporting sexual harassment on a lot of university campuses, and we know that the reports and the instances are about people coming forward are going up so one of the things for me is we fight really hard to make sure that every young person in this country has an opportunity to go on to university i don't want young women to go to university and experience sexual harassment because i know that that will be a very distressing experience for them so i'd love to see every university signing up to some of the protocols we've been talking about recently about um, how they deal with those reports who investigates how seriously it's taken so that we're really sending a strong message that everybody should be able to learn in this country without fear or hope Sure, so that answers the next question, which is what do you think should be done? But I want to move on. You mentioned briefly in, um, when you were speaking earlier about the sexualisation, that sort of culture that exists. So I'm going to tie that into the, the page three model, mm. uh, the page three sort of campaign, anti page three campaign that you've yeah. been very proactive in. Yeah. Um, critics of it say that there's more important things that the feminists should be focusing on. What are your. What are you know, that's about? funny, isn't it? There's always bigger things when it comes to equality. I get this all the time. It's always that something else should be considered more important. People usually come in and tell you this, not asking my opinion. I, I mean, there, there's two things I would say about that. First and foremost, uh, the page three campaign was never about women, it was about the impact of those kind of images being circulated around. So it's never about saying to somebody, you shouldn't look at. You know, you shouldn't be attracted by a woman's body. It was about saying, if we put these out as a matter of course, we kind of say that this is a normal part, this is what you should see in women, this is the impact. So it was opening up a whole platform for people to hear what women were saying about the experience of seeing that. So in that sense, it wasn't, the bigger thing for me was about a voice for a group of people who hadn't been heard before in that debate, who'd never had their experiences, the impact of, of seeing you're seeing female bodies every single day objectified in that way, what it did for people, the fact that when you were sat down on a bus and if somebody opened a copy of The Sun, suddenly you felt very uncomfortable that you know young girls were being told that that's what mattered about them. Um, if you don't think a woman's voice is a big thing, that's a problem to me. <laughs> but more importantly, this kind of idea that there are like really big inequalities and the little ones don't matter, the whole point for me, and I'm sure you've got people studying Gramsci, is that they're all interconnected, is that actually the little things help support the big things. So basically, um, it's a bit like the, the kind of online harassment stuff, it's to say, if we allow to go unchallenged the idea that women have to put up with these things, that women have to accommodate inequality, however big or small it is, then the inequality itself becomes that much more palatable. So it's that much easier to pay women less, to beat them, to rape them. And bear in mind, I mean, the One Billion Rising campaign is about the fact that one in three women around the world will be beaten or raped in her lifetime. If also we're kind of saying what matters about them is not their brains, but their boobs. What matters about them is how they're perceived, not what they want to say themselves. So for me, it wasn't ever an either or, you know, um, may come as a shock to some of the men's rights activists, but feminists can multitask, you know. <laughs> we can care both about structural pay inequalities, violence against women, and the perception of women. It's not an either or, it's about how all these things support each other to oppress 51% of the population. I mean, that's what the patriarchy is. Sure, thanks. I'm gonna move on now um, to the general elections. Sure. Uh, so 
most recent poll that I've seen, Labour are ahead on 34%, um, and the Tories are just 1% behind the 33 um, Do you think we, we're going to see a Labour government, a, a, a majority Labour government, oh. in May? And Listen, I, I, I certainly <laughs> hope so. The reason why I look so tired today is because I've been campaigning non-stop and try to help candidates around the country and support people and make the case Obviously, I have to get myself re-elected. I will be standing again for Labour in um, Labour on the Court Party, in fact, in Walthamstow. The honest truth is, at the moment, it feels very uncertain to me because it's not that people don't have opinions, but they don't necessarily connect that to politics. And so, actually, when you talk to people at the election, although they're very passionate about all sorts of issues, they have big views about you know what's facing the country and what the the challenges are maybe for the area that they live in, the things that they really want to see happen in the future. Do they see politics as the process by which those things happen is the big question. So do they think that voting and taking part at all is the big challenge? And, you know, I've, I've uh, set up a project called the XX Vote, just return a bit briefly to women, um, which is about the fact that the group in our society who are least likely to register vote, least likely to participate, are young women aged 18 to 24. Young women aged 18 to 24 have plenty to give the world. They have a, a huge range of opinions, lots of disagreements with things I would stand for about... Um, how the world should be, but they don't see the political process for them. Um, and going out campaigning, a lot of the time when you're talking to people, even if they have a view on a political party, whether that will translate into them actually taking part in the election, whether people, although they feel that there are big choices to be made, feel that in this building that's where it's happening is, is the challenge for all of us as politicians. So, you know, a lot of my job is trying to convince people that change can be made and therefore to think about the changes they want to see being made. I Which is what, perhaps different from, it's going to make it sound awful to say it, but when I was your age and when I was <laughs> first involved in campaigning, when people, when turnout was higher and people had a sense that it, it was really important to take part, but they were looking at particular different parties and trying to decide which one they would vote for. You know, it's a very different circumstance when you're trying to get cut through people's frank, frankly indifference to traditional politics rather than indifference maybe to your political party. Sure. Um, uh, there's been some sort of um, concern portrayed, I think, uh, with Ed Miliband as a leader. There's been um, instances where some backbench MPs as well have expressed concern about his leadership. Um, what do you think, personally? So, is he really and, and it's interesting, isn't it, because British politics is becoming a lot more like American politics in that sense, even though this isn't a presidential election. You know, you elect a team. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, for me, Ed Miliband isn't going to win or lose the next election for Labour. Labour will get win the next election or lose the next election on the basis of the team we put forward and the ideas we put forward and how we capture people's imagination. That's a job for all of us. So, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with Ed and he's a good, kind man. And, yeah, you know, a lot of the media coverage is very harsh and doesn't do him justice. But I know my own responsibility, which is to make the case for Labour in Walthamstow and to be part of some of the national campaigns. And I see that for everyone involved in progressive politics. You know, one of the, the problems perhaps for me is that I've progressed up involved in the Labour movement for twenty over twenty years now is we can get really grumpy. We can we can give up on the idea that we can make the case. We can get very frustrated because if you believe that you go into politics not just to change governments but to change lives, it can be really overwhelming if it feels like change isn't happening. I mean when I first the first election I ever took part in, which was nineteen ninety seven, it was an article of faith to me that governments made a difference because all my life all I'd seen is a government I thought was doing terrible things to the country. I stayed involved because I think it does make a difference and I've seen real change. But I also recognise that I've got to convince people that we can change the political process to meet their ambitions in the future. Of course the leader of the party, the Prime Minister, will be a big part of that. But that's also about how you work at the grassroots. I mean, that's also about how people feel their role is in all of it. That's why I say people are really indifferent. You know, do you know what difference you will make to Britain in the next 20 years? My job is to get that out of you because that's how we'll make a better country. Sure, OK, so let's, let's talk about how um, Labour's appealing to the young vote. Um, it was mentioned... I love it when I get asked about the young <laughs> vote because it, it, it's a symptom, perhaps, of our politics that people think of me as being involved and a, and a young person. I'm, I'm nearly 40. So... <laughs> So that, that's the great thing about politics. I can thoroughly recommend it in terms of like what people think of as young. Carries on well on PRs. I was a youth worker before I got elected, and one of the young people I worked with sent me my picture. He downloaded it off the internet. He airbrushed it, sent it to me, and said, "Use this in your leaflet. It will be better." <laughs> I've always known I'm not 
representative of young people anymore. Have you used that picture then? No, <laughs> no, I just, I had a bit of a cry. <laughs> because I know he meant really well, but it, sure. but it was heartbreaking. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about the um, £6,000 institution mm. cap that the Labour, uh, Labour Party is planning to introduce. Um, how, how exactly is this initiative going to be funded? And, um... Sure, um, well it comes through changing pension tax rate relief, but I would say it's really important not to see the tuition fee announcement big as though it is for people, and I know for a lot of people it will hit home because it is a very, you know, 9,000 pounds is a lot of money, so it's a big cut to make, but to see it in the broader context of why it all matters. I went into politics, you know, I, I love Walsham Star, I've lived there for 18 years, it is full of incredibly um, intelligent bright, sparky, cheeky, sarky kids, just like I was at their age, they don't always get the opportunity to succeed. And one of the reasons they don't always get the opportunity to succeed is because their families are living with large amounts of debt because the financial struggle of getting on and getting ahead makes it harder for them to learn, let alone to make the decision to go to university. So yes, if you're thinking about the choices we make as a country, the more people who go to university, the more people who get skills, the more likely they are to be able to, to work in the future world economy and changing the way in which we therefore use our public resources. So right now we subsidise people who get um, pensions of, who earn more than £150,000. That's what we would change um, and that would help pay for this for the, for the cut in fees is, is part of the equation. But the other part of the equation is the more people we can get going to university, the more people we can stop that idea that actually fees stop you going to university the more they will then go on and earn money and actually pay back money. Um, but it's not on its own the only thing that's going to make a difference. So one of the other things I'm really involved in is a campaign to end unpaid internships. Because I talk to a lot of people from Walthamstow who, even when they get a degree, are then finding the world of work is closed to them because they don't maybe have the networks to get the work experience or they can't afford to work for free for six months for a company to build up the points on their CV. So I think it's really, really important to see the pledges on... Um, unpaid, uh, so the, the pledges on tuition fees in that context of how do we change those odds? For a kid from Walthamstow, how do we change their odds so we get more apprenticeships into the system? Because we've got a lot of apprenticeships right now that uh, are actually being taken by people over the age of 25. We change the funding system so we get bigger grants and we, get, we cut the fees. And we also open up the world of work once you've got that degree so there's more chance of you getting a foot on the, on the career ladder and getting on and getting ahead. Because we live in the country in the world that has the least social mobility of all, and that should shame all of us. That means that there's really bright, talented young people in places like Walthamstow not getting those chances to succeed. We're talking about young people in mm -hmm. jobs. Let's talk about very quickly um, young people in politics, because you're someone who got involved in politics pretty young. Um, how can you? Yes, it was a long time ago. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, we've seen yeah. now that um, young people find. It Quite difficult to get involved, involved in politics. Why do you think that is, and how do you think that, that can change? I, I don't think it's so much about young people finding it difficult to get involved in politics. Whether they feel they want to get involved is another matter, and I, I, I take that and I accept that. Look, this place is Hogwarts gone wrong. You know, it breaks my heart that when you come here, you're considered a stranger. If you go to the German Parliament, it says for the people. So I really want to change our politics in this country because I don't think 650 people have the preserve on all the best ideas and best solutions. I want everyone to be part of that. And I think for a lot of young people, they look at our political process and think, I don't, it's not that I just don't understand it, I don't see it making change anytime soon. And we want to make change. Like I say, I still feel like I did when I was 15, when I was campaigning on um, baby block action and social justice in my local community. I want to change the world. You have to sit through an awful lot of meetings that I call arm shoers in this place, and I, I did at a local level. The answer to me isn't to say to you, look, you've got to get used to the armchairs. The answer is to change the armchairs. It's to change the way in which we do politics. So I really want people from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life to feel they want to be part of that process. Um, and in that sense, we have to find a common, a common aim. Because ultimately what matters is that we share the same set of values and we share a sense of how the world could be. I have to convince you that politics is worth that and I have to challenge you that it's not enough just to have anger. You know, I, I've come from a campaigning background. I've worked with a lot of organisations like 38 Degrees, I have a lot of time for the people who got involved in the Occupy movement, but for me, just being angry about how the world is isn't good enough because those young people in Walthamstow need me to come up with answers. They need me to be part of pushing and saying, okay, how do we change the fee system? How do we change the fact that they can't get a, a foot on the door in the, career, in the door in the careers world because of unpaid internships? How do we make sure there are more apprenticeships so that those young people who want to go into vocational qualifications get those opportunities? Politics is about answers at its best. And I know lots of young people have lots of answers, but they don't see that process connection. It's a two-way partnership we've got to get right. So I've got to push them to be part of it, and they've got to help me push it to be a different kind of politics. When we do that, 
will be unstoppable. Stella, thank you very much. Last thing before you go, Cambridge Odyssey. Oh, neither. <laughs> Walthamstow every time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks so much. No worries.